Advanced TV Herstory, where hearty discussion of all things TV draws a smart circle around lessons of leadership, persistence, and achievement. Every time you tune in, you'll find fresh perspectives and dots that get connected to reveal just how powerful TV is to women and how important it is that we're represented. Find this podcast wherever you listen to others, plus Spotify, Pandora, and YouTube. You can also learn more about the podcast on www.tvherstory.com and catch what we're up to on Instagram and Twitter. Okay, on with the show. Where would women in TV be today without our lady detectives? Welcome to this episode of Advanced TV Herstory, a refresh on the podcast's very first episode on the Nancy Drew TV series from 1977. One of the most iconic detectives ever, Nancy Drew, is back on TV for the first time in 40 years. The CW premiered a new adaptation this October 2019. With so many updates made to the series to reflect the new decade Nancy's now in, let's take a look at our favorite girl sleuths' first foray into TV. The Hardy Boys slash Nancy Drew Mysteries. This series, which ran from 1977 to 1979, is perhaps the most enigmatic mystery she's ever been involved in. The mystery of why the 1977 series was so unnecessarily bad and forgettable. More than 50 Nancy Drew mystery books were written before the advent and availability of television, and as a result, our favorite girl sleuths set the stage for so many memorable characters like Pepper Anderson of Police Woman, Christine Cagney and Mary Beth Lacey of Cagney and Lacey, and Veronica Mars. We'll explore what went wrong with the 70s TV series by looking at these three problems. That the main legendary character just didn't seem to transfer well to the screen, atrocious writing and plot development, and finally, missing the memo and not keeping up with a new wave of TV that celebrated women's independence, risk-taking, and intelligence. It was the 70s, after all. Why didn't a character as well-developed as the inimitable, beloved Nancy Drew come alive? Here's ingredient for failure number one. Compared with Hardy Boys plots, Nancy Drew episodes were, in a word, painful. The storylines were overly simplistic and didn't relate at all to the show's target audience, teen girls. It was this criticism that prompted star Pamela Sue Martin to quit the show in the middle of season two. Replaced for the show's final three episodes by Janet Louise Johnson, Martin got the last word, of sorts, when she posed for Playboy, trench coat and fedora in hand, and revealing her... <clears throat> story. It seems like Nancy was pushed to the wayside in her own shared time slot. Sure, the Hardy Boys stars Parker Stevenson and Sean Cassidy were wildly popular in 1977. And sure, Nancy Drew's target audience, 13-year-old girls, wasn't exactly fluent in critical thinking as feminists, per se. They may have tuned in to unravel the mystery and had their moms beside them on the couch. Or they might have only tuned in for Sean Cassidy, tight pants and all, and for this week's edition of Tiger Beat. In any case, it's safe to say that Nancy's adaptation on the small screen wasn't particularly a hit. Nielsen ratings show that when given the choice, more viewers are watching Frank and Joe rather than Nancy. The Hardy Boys were renewed for a third season. Nancy Drew stopped at two. It's disappointing that the Nancy Drew mysteries didn't fit into the timeline of strong women roles in TV at the time. It suffered the same fate as the movies from the late 1930s, which starred Bonita Granville as Nancy being forgotten. It's important to understand how Nancy as a brand and the series as a franchise were nursed and nurtured through the years. The backstory of the women and the man behind the collection of books is its own drama. The first Nancy Drew book, The Secret of the Old Clock, was published in 1930 and was written by a woman named Mildred Wirt Benson, nay Mildred Augustine. The series publisher, Stratemeyer Syndicate, was a renowned source for children's literature throughout the late 19th and mid-20th centuries, and required that their books be written by many authors under the same pseudonym. In the case of Nancy Drew, the pseudonym was Carolyn Keene, a name that perhaps you're more familiar with. In effect, Mildred Burt Benson, who wrote the first 23 books in the Nancy Drew series and established Nancy's grit, inventiveness, and quick thinking, was virtually unknown. She was a ghostwriter. Read Melanie Rehack's 2005 book entitled Girl Sleuth, Nancy Drew and the Women Who Created Her to learn more about the history behind this iconic series. It's published by Harcourt. In her book, 
Author Melanie Rehack tells the grand story of the series' origins, the syndicate of ghostwriters who consistently turned out content and were paid per manuscript. To be a writer for the Stratemeyer Syndicate, one of the most successful publishing houses ever, meant that a writer like Mildred Wirt Benson waived any credit or public rights of authorship, as well as compensation besides her per manuscript fee. Royalties were not in the picture. In describing the writing process behind Nancy Drew, Benson says, The plots provided me were brief, yet certain hackneyed names and situations could not be bypassed. Therefore, I concentrated upon Nancy, trying to make her a departure from the stereotyped heroine commonly encountered in the series books of the day. Sounds great, right? Well, not to Edward Stratermeyer of the Stratermeyer Syndicate. He apparently greatly disliked the first Nancy Drew book and even said that Nancy was too flip. However, the public went absolutely wild for the books and they've been in print with new ones being added to the roster to this day. That's more than 600 books. Who could have known how lucrative the Nancy Drew and Hardy Boys series would become for decades, spanning the majority of the 20th century till now? The parameters surrounding Nancy Drew set by her founders at the Stratemeyer Syndicate show how they crafted her as a character that was both a puzzle-solving whiz, but also very privileged. One, Nancy would never marry. Two, she would never get involved in a serious romantic relationship. Three, her plots would also lack a strong mother figure in order to feature her problem solving more prominently and, wait for this one, number four, she would never be faced with money worries. In 1938, Warner Brothers purchased all Nancy Drew movie rights. That's right, all rights, with no time limits, from the Stratemeyer Syndicate and released a film adaptation that year titled Nancy Drew Detective. Benita Granville played the leading role. As you can imagine, critics paid close attention to the transfer of this hot property to the silver screen, and they found flaws. Ultimately, the films never matched the book series' popularity. In her book, Rehack writes, In general, everyone talks down to Nancy, and that was still the case with the characters in the TV series some 40 years later. Given the brand parameters, it just proved too difficult to fast-forward Nancy and parachute her into the mid-1970s. In novels written before Title IX, the ERA, second or third wave feminism, Nancy Drew showed that true confidence was developed from within. Because of that, readers of the series could see parts of themselves reflected in Nancy as they grew up with her and joined her on her various adventures. Even with today's reboot, it has to be a great challenge to depict the legendary Nancy Drew confidence so that it's still relatable. This beloved young woman character, celebrated and understood by every reader, existing a certain way in their minds. Maybe this is why the film and TV adaptations took the easy way out and made Nancy into more of a paper doll. Sure, she can solve crimes, but isn't she pretty? And the character never succeeded beyond the limits of the printed page. So in hindsight, maybe Nancy should have stayed frozen in time in the 30s as a period series with all the attendant plots, fashion, and visuals, sort of similar to how the Wonder Woman series starring Linda Carter was set in World War II. Here's ingredient for failure number two. It takes pretty bad writers and producers to develop inane plots and dialogue, particularly when the source material is so rich and well-loved. The popularity and reach of the book series meant people had huge expectations when the show aired from 1977 to 1979. Let's review the details. In 1977, if you were a girl looking for a TV series you could relate to that wasn't a Western or about war or a male homicide detective, then you probably waited patiently each week for the Hardy Boys Nancy Drew mysteries to come on. But even then, sometimes teen girls had to wait patiently another week. This was because while the show was billed as half Hardy Boys and half Nancy Drew, it really was about two-thirds Hardy Boys with the remaining episodes being either Nancy Drew episodes or ones that featured them all together. In season two, Nancy and the boys met for the first time in Paris and traveled to Transylvania to find Mr. Hardy. This is an example where a two-part segment was billed as a Hardy Boys mystery with Pamela Sue Martin just guest starring as Nancy Drew. But even then, teen girls sometimes had to wait patiently another week. 
This was because, while the show was billed as half Hardy Boys and half Nancy Drew, it really was about two-thirds Hardy Boys, with the remaining episodes being either Nancy Drew episodes or ones that featured them all together. Well into the modern women's movement, the Nancy Drew series should have been the logical springboard to her 21st century peer, namely Veronica Mars. Nancy's name even comes up every once in a while in Veronica's dialogue. Time for a chat? Well, I think if hell froze over, maybe it'd be on the news. I just want to hear more about the steroids you bought last weekend. You mean the steroids Luke bought? Wow, you suck at this Nancy Drew stuff. You should get a new hobby. So you knew he was doing it? You actually think that I would tell you anything? Hmm. I guess we're done here, officer. Nancy Drew, in all her books, and Veronica, in her many seasons, hold their own as teen detectives against a host of bad guys and dangerous situations. They're forces of good, and they're polite. That's why it's so frustrating that the renowned, respected, and popular Nancy Drew series never got a fighting chance. One look at Nancy Drew season 2 plot summaries reveals a certain lightness in plot and setting. The very first episode was Nancy crossing paths with an old high school classmate played by Maureen McCormick. Yes, Marsha, Marsha, Marsha. Maureen plays an emerging tennis star who is known by her father and coach to be a kleptomaniac. Nancy ends up shadowing Maureen at Maureen's father's request to keep her out of trouble and return stolen goods. Huh. Sounds exciting. Nancy's initial cover is blown almost immediately. Undercover as a sports writer, Nancy is supposed to stake out the Las Vegas hotel where Maureen McCormick's character is playing at a tennis tournament. However, Nancy is introduced to a man who just happens to claim to know pretty much every sports writer in the market. So when she's asked the reason for her Las Vegas stay, she makes up that she's the girlfriend of tennis player Sandy Castelli. The plot of Nancy Drew's love match, yes, that's the title, can you hear my eyes rolling, never really gets off the ground. The mystery draws to a close, and the guy originally hired to track Maureen's character is revealed to be a thief as well. Imagine the lessons an impressionable teenage girl of the day might get out of this epilogue. Maureen confesses that while she won the tennis trophy, she also has a problem. Kleptomania. It seems like a female character can't just walk away a winner. There has to be something wrong with her. And on top of that, it's a disorder that's deeply rooted in materialism, in the consumption of goods. Marina is defined not by her personality, but by the objects to which she's drawn. This devalues her character even more and is an awfully flat depiction of young women who were already woefully underrepresented in TV in the 70s. The authorities give Nancy modest credit for unraveling all the details, but just as they are celebrating the tennis tournament win, tennis player Sandy Castelli approaches Nancy and asks her out to dinner. We giddily shift from Nancy's strength as a sleuth to her needing to prepare to dine with an older man. I guess justice and fighting crime can wait. What's important here is getting ready for a dinner date. The second plot from the second season, and I won't go any further because I think we're all smart enough to see a trend, is the episode called Will the Real Santa Claus? Rick Springfield is a heartthrob guest star who makes it clear he's looking out for Nancy. You should have read this morning's newspaper, Mr. Cortez. You'd have read that they arrested someone else as the Christmas thief. And they found your bag of silver. I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, I think you do. A stable can be a dangerous place. A horse can kick you right in the head. You know what I mean? So far, the police can only book you on robbery because you haven't hurt anybody yet. You don't think I'd be so stupid as to come here without calling the police first? They'll be here any second. They're on their way. I really should have taken care of you last night. All right, get him out of here. I have a fingerprint I lifted from a doorknob at the Garlands. I'm sure it's going to match Mr. Cortez's. But we'll get our forensic boys right over to your house. Can I take you home, Nancy? That's all right. I'll take care. How did you become cavalry? 
Your girlfriend told me what you were doing. I didn't like the sound of it. I thought I'd check it out. I didn't want to look like an amateur. What was that for? It was for saving my life. I'm gonna have to do that more often. You know something? You're really not so bad after all. <laughs> I'm going to hand it to you. You said you'd prove Griffin was innocent, even if you didn't prove he was Santa Claus. By 1978, female detectives were not being saved by would-be boyfriends who just happened to be lingering. That was even the case in the days of The Mod Squad, which aired from 1968 to 73 and positioned Julie Barnes, played by Peggy Lipton, alongside Link Hayes, played by Clarence Williams III, and Michael Coles, Pete Cochran. TV in the late 60s into the early 70s was such that a woman in danger was likely to be saved by a man. But that started to change, and in 1976, when a trio of trained police officers turned private detectives emerged on the scene, Jill Monroe could count on Sabrina Duncan and Kelly Garrett to have her back. Sound familiar? If you were thinking Charlie's Angels, you're right on the money. Charlie's Angels demonstrated that women can watch out for each other. As the saying goes, there's no eye in team, but in the case of Charlie's Angels, there's always good hair. Going back to the last audio clip, Rick Springfield saving Nancy's life. Honestly, not really, since the police were about five seconds behind him. This is just bad writing, and it was exactly this sort of plot and character laziness that Pamela Sue Martin lamented in her July 1978 Playboy magazine interview. Martin said in the interview, I don't consider the series a particular achievement. Obviously, it has certain limitations. Nancy Drew never cried or experienced an inordinate amount of pain. There was never any tragedy or extreme emotion, never a kissing scene or any sign that she would indulge with the opposite sex. Martin goes on to recall, A big moment for her was coming across an old skeleton in a dungeon and screaming, or being attacked by a bat in Transylvania. Some of it was so bad, I found myself cringing. Gosh, we've just spent so much time discussing all the shortcomings of the show, but when all is said and done, despite its problems, the Nancy Drew Mysteries is still worth watching if you ever get a chance. And here's why. A few redeeming points to the show come in the form of Nancy Drew herself. Remember in the books how she drove a blue convertible? True to form, TV Nancy drives a light blue Mustang. Not a convertible, but pretty snappy. So while girls and moms alike were probably traumatized by the plots, at least Pamela Sue Martin's wardrobe and hair are a solid fashion time capsule. In her appearance in Transylvania with the Hardy Boys, Nancy shared more details, made more phone calls, and put more clues together than the Hardy Boys did. Considering they're supposed to be sleuths too, Nancy definitely was an overachiever. It's interesting to note, and kind of unbelievable, that most of the characters in the Nancy Drew mysteries are men who come across as threatened, arrogant, and short-tempered. These men ranged in ages from 35 to 55, and usually wore suits, except for the real characters, who wore large print shirts with plaid sports coats. Receding hairlines, comb-overs, and toupees were bountiful. Were these characters supposed to be this simplistic? What was up with the casting? Maybe, just maybe, some sick writer thought it important to subvert the emerging power of womanhood with a reminder of who really controls things in real life. Poise from a young woman who achieves the goal without ever having to raise her voice? Have the courage to look for clues and be prepared? Oh no, we must stop that girl before she's on to us. Or maybe the writers weren't smart enough to embed subliminal messages in the script. They were just sexist and scared, like the very characters they were crafting. One wonderful contrast to those chokers, though, was Nancy's dad, Mr. Carson Drew. Mr. Drew was an attorney who relied on Nancy to investigate for his cases and was played by William Shallard. Nancy's relationship with her father was grounded in respect. He treated her like an adult. Did you find out what's missing yet? Oh, uh, gee, I'll, I'll tell you later, hon, after my double vision goes. Hi, George. I'm sorry, Mr. Drew, I really didn't... <laughs> Stop. Listen, uh, the main thing is that the two of you are okay. You know, I, I think you're very fortunate young ladies. And I'll, um... I'll find out what's missing after I've gone through all of these files and folders. There seem to be several files missing. Hmm, that's odd. Well, now that's a nuisance. What's a nuisance? Well, I can't find the folder on the sale of Aunt Ruby and Aunt Leela's farm. Has no intrinsic value. Now I'll have to go up to the Capitol and get the sale documents replaced. 
Well, I thought that sale was all wrapped up. Well, not until we close escrow tomorrow. We can't do that without those papers. You'll have to call Aunt Ruby and tell her. I don't envy you that. Yeah. Here's the third ingredient for failure in this sad, sad story we'll just call Nancy Drew and the love-hate relationship with the women's movement. Some say that Nancy's power for the reader is founded in the reader's imagination. Everyone has a different idea of what she looks like, how she sounds, perhaps with an uncanny resemblance to the reader herself. You could devote hours to the post-mortem of the TV show. Author Melanie Wehack asserts it maybe just couldn't compete alongside Charlie's Angels. Even the tamer, Mary Tyler Moore, was bringing her own 30-minute show to a close. Women were evolving at a pretty good speed, and the Nancy brand, five decades in the making, just wasn't keeping up. And within the context of pop culture of the day, I'm not sure that the Nancy brand and restrictive conservative roles about boys and money could have succeeded even with new writers and better hair for the male-supporting characters. Young Americans were more sophisticated than the Nancy Drew series writers expected them to be. They lived through Watergate. The first test tube baby was born in London. And on the tennis court, Martina Navratilova and Chris Everett showed the world that women could compete and win with no caveat of weakness. It just seems nearly impossible, thinking back to that year, to have come up with a series that would have done justice to the Nancy Drew that your mom and grandma read faithfully in the books, who could also hold her own in the windswept 70s. Yet in the absence of Nancy Drew, do we ever get Jessica Fletcher? Even for the women and men who never read a single chapter, Nancy Drew, the girl sleuth, is a shared experience. She embraced her own confidence and morals. She set a high bar for our fictional TV detectives and their imaginative creators who followed. Maybe it's a good thing the show, at least, is nearly forgotten. Until now. Dead Lucy. Horseshoe Bay's most infamous sea queen wore her crown for only one night. People say she still haunts our town. But I don't believe in ghosts. I believe in looking for the truth. Drew! Clam chowder! Table 8! Mysteries are everywhere, and I love solving them. Then life dropped a real mystery into my lap. So what do you five have to say? I'm looking at town screw up, ex-con, city girl, and Nancy Drew. Why does he say your name like that? She used to complicate my job. You mean do it for you? The CW brought the show back this fall with the reboot simply titled Nancy Drew. And, in many ways, it couldn't be more different from the show from the 70s. In this new version, Nancy, at first on the road to college, has been hit with a tragedy with the death of her mother. She stays behind in her hometown, not set in the Midwest anymore, but in Maine, and works as a waitress. The marked way the reboot sets itself apart from the original series is in twofold. The introduction of a plot with decidedly supernatural elements, a la the ever-popular Riverdale, and even the chilling adventures of Sabrina, and in the casting. Ghosts and spooky stuff aside, I see what you did there, CW. Capitalize on the Halloween spirit and all that. I think the casting and reimagination of the characters is something that deserves mentioning. The Nancy Drew series historically has been a text that contains racism, stereotyping, and eventually whitewashing. In the very first book, The Secret of the Old Clock, there's an African-American character named Jeff Tucker, a custodian of the estate where a robbery took place. He is painted as gullible, is infantilized, and is depicted as speaking in a dialect. Nancy is impatient with him and ultimately decides that he's no help in the matter, even though, realistically speaking, he's a key witness. She takes matters into her own hands. This uncomfortable, condescending portrayal of a person of color is something that we should not forget, even as we celebrate Mildred Wirt Benson's incredible work and Nancy's legacy that has inspired so many. To make things worse, in 1959, publishers Grosset and Dunlap re-released The Secret of the Old Clock, and this is what they did. They made Jeff Tucker white. Yep. Whitewashed the town and everyone in it and reinforced the kind of privilege Nancy has as a white woman. This is why the new CW reboot is pretty exciting in some ways. Nancy's best friends, George and Bess, as well as her love interest, are played by people of color. That's Madison Jaisani, Leah Lewis, and Tunji Kasim, respectively. 
I'm all for diverse casting. And I raise another question. What about Nancy? Can there ever be a reincarnation of Nancy who isn't white? It would be monumental, wouldn't it? Growing up, I certainly would have been absolutely obsessed with an Asian Nancy Drew. Just someone who looked like me. And why can't they be a reality in the future? It would be inclusive, diverse, awe-inspiring, and certainly very different from the origins from which she came. The CW has also introduced a lot more romance for Nancy, including a sex scene right off the bat in the pilot. I wonder what Pamela Sue Martin, who complained about Nancy's lack of realness, her lack of actual life experience, would say about that. But what wasn't enough in the 70s might be too much now, and I've read a few parents' objections to the explicitness of the series so far. Will we ever win with putting Nancy on the small screen? I think it just depends on how quickly society can change for the better. The sexism, racism, sizeism, yeah, sizeism. Bess is written as curvy, maybe even plus size. All these forms of discrimination are still prevalent today. We've made a lot of progress, it's true, but we can do better for Nancy. We can do better for us. Thanks for listening to Advanced TV Herstory, where, with this refresh, we're hoping that smart women writers are serving up a Nancy Drew for smart modern viewers of all ages. Do read Melanie Rehack's book, Girl Sleuth, Nancy Drew, and the Women Who Created Her. More can be found at her website, melanierehack.com, and Pamela Sue Martin has archived the Playboy interview on her website, pamelasuemartin.net. Head to tvherstory.com to subscribe to our e-newsletter, find out all our social media haunts, and check out old episodes. Our catchy theme song is Jazzer's Take Me Higher, which we found at freemusicarchive.com. It's a great source of music. Reviews and recommendations mean the world to us, and since Nancy Drew is a topic that even your mother, grandmother, or aunt might be interested in, here's your chance to teach them how to access podcasts. Not just through podcatchers, but via Spotify, Pandora, or YouTube. Just press play. It's been a blast discussing the Nancy Drew TV show throughout the years with you. I look forward to reading comments and seeing what you think. I'm your host, Catherine Yang. Thanks for listening.